Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emil, and uh, this is my talk title, Turn Hours into Seconds Using Flow for Concurrent Processing. So I was supposed to give this talk at ElixirConf UK, but I couldn't. Uh, I had to cancel my uh, travel because I felt sick. So let me take this opportunity to thank all of you to give me this wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about something that I'm really excited about. So uh, let's get started. I work with uh, a small team of developers at Codemancers where we build uh, web applications for our clients. So this talk is based on my recent experience working on a soft real-time system that we built completely with Elixir. So we're going to look at some of the performance optimizations that we did uh, that brought down the execution time of a critical part of the system from a little more than one hour to uh, a few seconds, actually. So first, uh, we look at an example that is similar to the real-world problem that we worked on. Uh, then we'll see the first version of the code that actually had a lot of concurrency problems. Then we look at a second version of the code that fixes the concurrency problems but brings in some other problems. And finally, we'll talk about the, uh, the actor pattern and the message passing concurrency model and how we use that to solve uh, the problem using Elixir. So let's look at our example. So we are building a module that does uh, season rankings for a multiplayer game. So after the season starts, uh, players from all over the country can come and play this game. And uh, there would be uh, maybe 100 players playing a game. And till the season ends, they can play this game. And at the end of the season, uh, there would be awards going out, or like prizes given to uh, the top scorers. So there is going to be a leaderboard that will be running throughout the season. And uh, the players will have a rank in this leaderboard. So basically, players get scores based on their actions in the game, uh, which in turn affects their ranks in the season leaderboard. Uh, remember that our, our ranks are not per game, but actually for the whole season. And uh, players can actually check their ranks whenever they want. The scoring calculation will be a function that looks like this. So these are based on the different in-game events like kills, deaths, and assists. So if you're familiar with uh, Counter-Strike or something like that, it's, it's like that. So there'll be kills, deaths, and assists, and then the final score will be a function of these. And these uh, in-game events are actually stored inside a database as the game progresses. So first version of the code is something as simple as this, where uh, we have a function that calculates the scores of all the players and uh, of a game, and then re-ranks all the players in the system, and then saves the scores and ranks in the database. So we call this function right when the game ends, and we make it asynchronous by wrapping it inside a task. So after each game, uh, there would be a task that spawned that would run the scoring and ranking. And uh, because the tasks run inside separate processes, they can run concurrently. But when we tested this first version, we found that the calculations were going wrong. So we, we would get duplicate ranks, and uh, th this would happen very randomly. So uh, we clearly have concurrency problems here. So let's understand what's going wrong. So the current, so let's say the current top score in this season is 100. And two games just finished and uh, at the same time and then two asynchronous tasks were spawned, which would calculate the sco scores and ranks for the players, right? So in each process or in each task, the algorithm would find one top scorer because there is one player whose score is more than 100 in each game. So when these tasks finish execution, will end up with two players with rank one. So how do we solve this problem? So what is the first thing that we do when we have concurrency problems, or what we are taught to do? So we use locks, right? So we wrap our code inside a lock so that only one scoring can happen at a time. 
So this is how we uh, write global locks in Elixir, I mean, or Erlang for that matter. So this will make sure that only one, one of this will run at a, at a time on all the nodes that you have in your cluster. So we use global.trans for this. So now without concurrency, uh, this is how the execution timeline would look. Because there is no concurrency, uh, it would take a really long time for the scoring to finish, but at least we don't have any bugs right now. But wait, uh, we have actually some other problems to deal with. So we are still in beta, that means uh, we are still in the process of fine tuning our uh, scoring function. So we have some constants that we use inside the function and we have to fine tune them to remove our outliers in our scoring. So there'll be somebody who will have like high score in some uh, formula and then we have to uh, remove outliers by adjusting the constants. So uh, every time we do this, and we do this multiple times a day maybe. So every time we do this, uh, we have to redo the scoring of all the players for the whole season. And uh, yeah, so this is how the iteration would look like. So the requirements would change, and uh, we'll understand the requirements and we change the code. And then uh, after we change the scoring function, we'll run the scoring again, and we'll have to wait for about an hour because we have like a lot of games happening. So we re redo the scores for all of them. And then we find out that we have another bug. So the problem is that our scoring code is not idempotent. So in order to avoid recalculating a player's score with using all the in-game events of the whole season again and again, we actually calculate the score for this current game and then just add it to the existing score of that user. So this makes the calculations really fast uh, but this means we cannot run scoring multiple times because the scores would get added multiple times and we would end up with the wrong scores. So now the iteration looks like this. First we change the scoring function and then we delete all the scores. We now do a scoring from the blank state and then wait for an hour to verify. And then we end up feeling bad for ourselves because we actually almost thought that this process is good. <laughs> But it's not good. It's not all right. There has to be a better way. We have to make our scoring item potent. But that would mean the scoring would take forever to complete. It would take a really long time because uh, we are using all their in-game events for the whole season to calculate the scores. And we have to do this for every game one after the other. And we do this every game one after the other because we have locks. But hold on, why are we even using locks in Elixir when we have the actor model? So previous talks, the excellent talk by Brian also talked about the actor model. Uh, so I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it, but again, uh, so the actor model of concurrency uh, says we don't create locks and uh, locks on shared state and change the shared state ourselves, but instead we'll let an actor own the state and we'll send a message to the actor and ask it to change it for us. So let's rethink our solution in terms of actors and message processing. So when each game ends, uh, it will send a message to a scoring queue. And the message is going to be a game ID. The scoring queue will forward uh, a list of game IDs that it collected to an actor uh, that fetches a list of player IDs from this list of game IDs. This actor now has a list of player IDs and yeah, uh, it just sends it to a, an actor which is responsible for scoring the players. And this function is going to be item potent, that means it will use all the in-game events from the database for the whole season. Yeah, before that. So, uh, when we do this, this actor is going to be around for some time, right? So we can do some interesting stuff like caching and eager loading and all these things here. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then after scoring, we uh, this actor will send a message to another actor to trigger a re-ranking of all the players in the system. So uh, 
let us look at different ways we can build this message passing system in Elixir. We could use processes. Uh, a process, as you already know, is an entity which executes a function and it can send and receive messages. So if you use processes, all our actors are going to be processes like this. And each process will have a loop which receives a message from a sending process and then does some computation and sends another message to a receiving process down the stream. But this receive loop will have to be written by us. But we have more than processes in Elixir. We have OTP, which is a library of behaviors or rather like design patterns that uh, we can use to quickly build solutions to common problems. So OTP is a higher level of abstraction, so we don't have to write custom uh, receive loops, but instead we'll write callback functions that the behavior requires and we're all set. Uh, in addition to that, modules that are OTP compliant can be added under a supervision tree, which, which makes them fault tolerant. And also there are a lot of tools that OTP comes with which we can use for debugging and inspecting the systems when things go wrong. So gen stage is uh, such a behavior that is available in Elixir. It's not there in Erlang, uh, which helps us create demand-driven message passing stages where each stage can be a producer, a consumer, or a combination of both, like a producer-consumer. Let's see how we can build our pipeline using gen stages. So this is how it would look like. So, so here, each producer emits an event or events from its queue whenever the consumer downstream has a capacity or a demand to consume them. So in this case, let's say uh, the second stage, uh, which can fetch players, if it can process more events from the previous stage that is scoring queue, the scoring queue will take a bunch of game IDs from its queue and then send these events downstream. So all this sounds good, but can we create something better? Something like this, where we have many concurrent stages. So given my past experiences building applications with a lot of moving parts in Ruby and C++, I find building something like this in those languages non-trivial at all. But in Elixir, we can build this concurrent event processing pipeline, which would allow us to uh, plug our application code inside it in less than 10 lines of code. So all this magic and heavy lifting is done by this little library called Flow, which is created and maintained by the Elixir team. So let's recap and look at the levels of abstractions, abstractions we're talking about. So first, we talked about processes, uh, which are the building blocks of state encapsulation and message passing. Then we discussed gen stages, which help us create uh, demand-driven message streams, and now we are discussing flow, which helps us create pipelines that do concurrent stream processing. So what is flow exactly? So flow is a module uh, with a bunch of functions built on top of gen stages. And we can use that for, developers can use that for expressing computational steps as a neat pipeline, which will get executed concurrently. So let's look at an example to understand this better. So let's say our job is to count the number of occurrences of letters in strings, like this. So we have a list of strings, and then we have to come up with this map where we count the number of occurrences of each letter in the string. So let's see how we can build this using the enum module. So first we'll have a list of strings. Next we'll call a flat map on the strings and then split the strings into words. So we'll end up with a big list of words. And then we'll do flat map again and then split these words into letters. So we'll use a function called string.graphemes for this, which basically does that. And finally, we'll prepare a map using uh, map.update and we'll use the reduce function. Uh, and then 
So the map update function uh, actually lets us set an initial value for each letter. And then if the keys collide, we can actually bump up that count by one. So the code would look like this. So let's see how we can rewrite the same thing using flow. So the first thing that we'll do is just replace all the enums with flow and nothing else. Uh, and lastly, we'll insert a function flow dot from enumerable, which basically takes the list of strings and hands it over to uh, the flow pipeline. So let's understand what these flow functions do behind the scenes. So flow dot from enumerable takes an enumerable and returns a flow struct. So uh, I think you already know what a struct is from the previous talk. So uh, it basically sets that enumerable inside the struct and uh, returns a struct. But it also does one thing that is smart. So it basically finds out the number of cores that are available on your computer and, and also sets that inside this map. So that means flow.flat map will now receive a flow struct and then a function called string.split. So let's, let's see what flow.flat map does with this. So uh, flow.flat map takes a flow struct and the function used for mapping and pushes this function into a list of operations inside the struct and returns that struct. So that means flow.reduce will again receive a flow struct and then also receives a reduce function. And let's see what flow.reduce does with these, right? So again, uh, it takes this flow struct, takes a reduce function, pushes, into it, pushes that into a list of operations again, and then returns this flow struct. So that means all of these functions just keep adding operations to a list inside the struct and just keeps passing around the struct downstream. So from this, we understand one important property about flow, that is, flow is lazy. The flow struct that gets passed around only gets evaluated when flow is asked to run. So we can make a flow run using, uh, by explicitly asking it to run by calling flow.run, or we can uh, enumerate the flow which forces it to run. So as you see here, we can pipe the flow to map.new or enum.toList which basically enumerates the flow, which runs the flow. Basically, it converts the output of flow to a list and then you can enumerate on it. The second property of flow is that flow is also concurrent. As you already saw, flow knows the number of uh, cores in your CPU and, I mean, in your computer, and uh, it uses this information when spawning uh, consumer stages to achieve uh, maximum concurrency. So when our flow pipeline runs on a machine with two cores, uh, flow will first spawn a producer, then spawn two consumers because we have two cores. Uh, these consumers will then subscribe to the producer. So inside the consumer, uh, flow will run each operation stored in flow struct one after the other. So the first operation in our flow struct is a map, a flat map operation. So uh, it basically calls string.split and then uh, splits the string into multiple words. The next operation is another flat map which splits the words into letters. So we'll call that after the first flat map. The last operation is a reduce function which results in a map of letters and the number of occurrences. Then finally, we call map.new, which basically enumerates the flow. And uh, this converts the results into a list, which is then given to given as the input to map.new. So finally, we, give, we get this result. So if you look at this closer, you can see that the counts are wrong. Right? There are two Fs and two, like four Os, but we get one F and two Os. Right? So what happened here? This happened because the same letter goes into both stages. So, so in both the stage, in, in each of these stages, uh, the counts are calculated separately. That means 
uh, f will have one occurrence in one stage and the same thing in the other stage and when this gets merged into a single map the values of one stage will overwrite the values of the other so in order to solve this flow provides something called uh, partitioning so you call this function flow dot partition which makes sure that the same message always goes to the same stage uh, this uses a hashing function internally so basically how the hashing function works is uh, you'll give it an input and then give a list of categories that or the number of outputs that are possible so it will categorize that into one of these categories so if you have four outputs or four stages then it basically give an index between 0 and 3 for any given input so after we called a flow dot partition flow created a set of new stages downstream and the same letter always goes to the same stream I mean same stage sorry so this way uh, the same letter does not get repeated in multiple stages and then we get get the uh, expected result so let's recap and look at the flow pipeline that we have created so far so we started by passing the strings into flow dot from enumerable which then uh, get split into words in a flat map operation then the next flat map operation splits the words into letters next we partition the letters into multiple stages and then we build the map with their terms so here's the final code for this pipeline so there are not many changes from the enum uh, code if you notice so we just changed the uh, enum calls with flow and we added flow dot from enumerable at the top so you can see a comparison here so we use flow dot flat map and uh, flow dot uh, reduce for transforming the data stream but there are a bunch of other functions that flow provides like uh, filter map reject etc which are basically similar to functions with the same names in the enum module and you can use these functions to transform the data in your event stream so let's go back to uh, our original problem of ranking players so uh, now that we know how flow works let's try to re-implement the same thing using flow instead of starting uh, with flow dot from enumerable we'll start the flow using flow dot, flow dot from stage this function is used because in our example we'll uh, we already have a scoring queue which is already built and it sits outside the pipeline so we just basically want to consume or create a consumer as the starting stage of our pipeline so we use flow dot from stage which basically uh, sets up a, a subscription to a producer that sits outside the pipeline so the events that we receive uh, as part of this like from this producer would be uh, game ids a list of game ids rather and then uh, next we use flow dot flat map to find the player ids using the game id so if you have a list of game ids we'll do a database query and find all the player ids for that list of game ids here next we do a partitioning uh, using player ids because we don't want to really score players uh, like the same player in multiple stages and save the scores in multiple stages concurrently because we would have like weird issues with concurrency if you do that so we want to make sure that one player id is always going to one stage so we partition it using the flow dot partition function next we use flow dot map to calculate the scores of each player and we do this in an item potent way uh, using all the events in the database or the in-game events that we have for the whole season so, so now uh, we pass the scores to the next uh, operation that is another map operation and then we save the scores in a database and after saving the scores in a database we emit events to a queue uh, which would basically trigger a re-ranking of all the system all the users in the system so this process that does re-ranking is again not inside the pipeline it sits somewhere outside 
So basically, it has a queue where it receives events uh, that trigger a re-ranking, and it may choose to run, let's say, once in five minutes, or once in 10 minutes, or maybe once in an hour. And that logic is not really part of this pipeline. So it sits outside the pipeline and then uh, receives these triggers, and then it may choose to do the re-ranking whenever it chooses to. So here is the final code that we have. Uh, so we, crea we created the flow pipeline using uh, the flow APIs, and then we can use flow.start link. So if, you're, if you've seen the start link, you know that it's something that can be used to establish links between processes. So that means you can use flow.start link to create this flow pipeline and put it under a supervision tree. So that will make it fault tolerant. So if, if at all there is any uh, edge case that we have not handled in, in any of these stages or any of these functions that, so basically player scorer dot score player is application code, right? It's not flow code. So if you have any bugs there, it doesn't crash the whole, I mean, it crashes it, it crashes the whole flow uh, pipeline, but it restarts it again because it's under our supervision tree. So as I mentioned before, it took less than 10 lines of code to actually build this topology of message passing uh, that does concurrent processing. We'll actually see some code uh, to compare the first version, which had locks, and the second version, which had flow. Don't see the mirroring option. Uh, can you guys see this in the back? There's a font already. There. It's okay, I have a lot of time. I plan for this. This is disconnected. Okay, so uh, so this is a uh, what do you say? I just scaffolded the project, so it doesn't have anything else. So we have uh, C. Okay, so uh, so this is the function that we already saw, right? So there is a there is a run function which basically does the scoring and everything. So we wrap this inside a task, and then we uh, call this function score players with a game ID which scores the game, and ignore these functions. Uh, I mean, this function is basically for uh, benchmarking because I wanted to count the number of games which are scored. So I put a call back. And then so uh, if you look at score players, uh, you'll notice that we accept the game ID and then we do all this uh, reading from the database and calculating total scores. So yeah, so this is the this is the part where it is not item potent. So we have existing scores and then we merge the new scores. Can you guys see it on the back? Okay. So we uh, we have existing scores and then we merge the new scores on it. And then we sort the scores and then we save it in one shot so that we can uh, save the ranks and uh, scores in one query basically. So,
Okay, so this is the, this is the last version where we have, uh, the third version where we have uh, used flow. And uh, so there is a new file here which is called scorer, which is, yeah, so which is uh, a file which basically contains only the flow pipeline. So everything else remains in the, the player scorer dot score player. So we have a scoring queue here, uh, which could be a, a producer, like a gen stage producer. So I'll just open score, scoring queue. Yeah, so here I've used gen stage again. So the scoring queue is a, is a producer, so let me wrap this. So uh, you can see in the init callback of the gen stage, we specify what kind of producer it is. So, I mean, what kind of stage it is. So here it is a producer. So uh, it will have a push interface where you can push game IDs to it. And then it will basically add those game IDs to a queue. And then when there is demand from the flow pipeline, the pipeline will ask for some game IDs from this queue. So it never just sends game IDs unless there is a demand. So if there is only, uh, let's say there are only two game IDs and then we basically say that, okay, the max demand is one. So the, the consumer would ask for one item instead of like a bunch of 500. The default I think is 500 or something. So I just ask for one game at a time. So you can specify what demand the, the consumer should deal with. So yeah, so these are basically uh, the uh, callbacks that we'll write for a gen stage. Uh, we'll have handle demand, which has the logic of how the demand should be handled and the events should be dispatched to the consumer. Uh, okay, so I'll come back to, I mean, this is not uh, the uh, the focus of this talk, so I'm not really going into details, but uh, we'll actually look at the, uh, the flow pipeline here. Hey, sorry guys, I cannot mirror this for some reason, so <laughs> start with this. So we have, uh, okay, we'll write for this. Game score. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is the pipeline. We already saw this. And uh, so one interesting thing to note is that so we already had this player scorer uh, module, but if I open this now, so uh, yeah. So earlier we used to score games. Now we we have started scoring players, right? So earlier we used to do uh, scoring one game after the other, but now we are doing a, like each player one after the other. So we'll get a bunch of player IDs and then we score players. So that means we'll look at all the games that the player has played uh, and then look at all the in-game actions and then fetch them, do some caching, and I'm not doing all those here. Uh, we'll do some eager loading and then uh, score a player. So that's, that's a difference here. So we have score player instead of score game. And uh, I can, so here I can, I'm using a small flow here, right? So whenever you have, you have a need for, uh, if you want to do a map, but you want to do a concurrent mapping, then you can always use flow because it's, it's very lightweight to spawn processes and then do things concurrently. So you can uh, make something concurrent just by doing this. You have a list and then you have to concurrently map over it. Okay, so let's come back to slide. So we're gonna do some benchmarking on top of this uh, code. And uh, the code is on GitHub. It's there if you want to like check out how this is written. So when we try to score uh, 100 games with 10 players in a game, uh, it took 48 seconds using uh, the version with locks, which means the games would be scored one after the other. 
and then using flow it took three seconds and when we uh, increase the load four times when the, the number of games became uh, 400 from 100 uh, it took six minutes to execute the scoring and ranking whereas it took only 15 seconds using uh, flow now uh, when we bumped it up to 1500 games it took one hour and 14 minutes to complete the whole scoring and using flow it took only 55 seconds so uh, this is not just because we made it concurrent but it's also because we made it into a flow pipeline we can do some uh, interesting things like caching and eager loading as I mentioned so what are the takeaways from uh, the stock so let's uh, so if you're using elixir or erlang and if you ever reach out for uh, locks then probably you should stop and think uh, and you should think if you can rewrite your algorithm using actors and message passing. Uh, think of event streams when you when you have to do computations uh, continuously and partition these streams into uh, multiple stages for achieving maximum concurrency. Finally, don't be afraid of concurrency. Elixir makes it easy, so use it to your advantage. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Or? I can take a few questions if you have. Okay. I guess no questions. So why don't you promised you'll ask a question? Yeah, uh, I have it. Okay, so you asked what happens when the number of players increases, right? Uh, okay, so for 100, I don't have it for 1,500 games because it would take too long, so I didn't record it. So uh, for 100 games, uh, when we start with five players, it took 1.3 seconds using flow. And with 10 players, it took 2.3 and then you can see here. So with 40 players, so okay, we'll compare this. So we have 10 players and it took 2.3. When we increased it four times, it basically increased four times. I'm not doing any caching or anything, so uh, a lot of things can be improved in this uh, demo because the sample code is kind of naive, not done anything else. All right, I think that's it. So uh, one thing is using logs, everything would happen one after the other, right? So here we have, uh, so basically we have made everything concurrent. So all these, all these uh, computations would happen concurrently. We uh, fetch from the database, we do everything concurrently and then we do re-ranking only once. So there we did ranking of all the players after each game. But here we are doing ranking in a separate system and we would trigger the ranking maybe once in five minutes or something. So we, we have that uh, flexibility here because we don't have to do it after every game. And ranking takes a lot of time because you basically load all the players from this, the whole season and then reorder them, them and basically save the rank, right? So. Yeah, so uh, the way we test this is a little tricky because we are passing messages around. So uh, what we do is we have some mock uh, producers and consumers just for testing and we produce this uh, events from the mock producer and then in the consumer we would assert that we got these messages yeah so we basically pass the message through the whole thing and then we'll uh, assert that the messages are received as expected okay, okay thanks guys thanks everybody <laughs>